All right, well, we'll move on. And uh, Len Richter, and I, I introduced Len or, uh, earlier, but uh, Len's the founder of the company uh, back in 1985. And he's been working on special projects the last few years since he retired. And one of his special projects is his uh, Knox Analyzer Converter Efficiency Tester, which is required in some parts of the country and not required in other parts of the country. And it's a little black box, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, and it's uh, it's over here on the table. So when we have, take a break uh, in a little bit, uh, I'm sure Len will stick around and show you around and uh, his uh, converter efficiency tester. So uh, he can talk about it. Just to kind of follow up on the uh, previous presentation, people kind of forget that in the system name is the word custom. So we can do most anything in a custom manner. We're not a large manufacturer that makes hundreds of something and try to sell it. We have our own fab shop, welding shop, if you want to call it that. So like I say, you've got a special need, sketch it out, and we will give you a cost. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I see we've got some SIMS technicians in the room here, uh, as well as some EHS people. Uh, so I'm going to bore the SIMS technicians five minutes or so, but I have to get some background uh, on this here. Um, the analyzers that we work with in the SIMS field are molecule counters. And there's no such thing as a Knox molecule. Mother Nature will kind of give you a strange look if you ask for a Knox molecule. Knox is the name to be given to the foundation of the NO nitrogen oxide and the NO2 molecule, nitrogen dioxide molecule. Okay. Um, clicker. Oh. Down out of the way. Okay. There you go. Here we go. So in the United States, the accepted technology for the measurement of NOx is an inward resistance technology. Um, but it only detects the NO molecule. And it detects chemical light given off in the NO molecule settles down to its steady state of NO2 exposed to the ozone. Okay. So basically, the chemiluminescence NOx analyzer is in reality an NO analyzer. It does not see the NO2 molecule. Uh, so to capture the NO2 in the sample, because we have both molecules, you know, NO and NO2 in most combustion uh, two gases, uh, there's an NO2 to NO converter in, in the chemiluminescence analyzer right into the analyzer. Uh, there are external NO2 to NO converters you can add to, say, an IR analyzer if you want this. Is, uh, Europe's um, accepted technology, but not ours. Uh, therefore, we can say we have a NOx analyzer. Let's understand that all we're looking at is the NO molecule. But the analyzer converts the NO2 to NO before the sample reaches the detector. Uh, so the efficiency of the NO2 to NO converter directly affects the point bounce value. That's to be assumed. Okay. Uh, and the SIMS regulations do require a minimum of 90% efficiency. Yeah, this requires testing the efficiency of the periodically to verify this efficiency. Okay. Uh, there are basically two types of NO2 to NO converters that are used in the chemiluminescence NOx analyzers. Uh, one type is catalyst. You know, this catalyst will lose efficiency over time as the catalyst is used up. 
they're actually graded in molecules per time. In other words, if you're graded, which is a very low number, say a thousand uh, ppm hours, you can convert one ppm for a thousand hours, or you can convert 10 ppm for a hundred hours. Right? So these catalysts will eventually deteriorate and um, need to have either the catalyst replaced or most catalyzers nowadays to replace the whole assembly that's needed. The other type is a stainless steel, and this was the first type that was used in chemiluminescent analyzers. Uh, thermal came out with the analyzers in the 70s. Um, However, this stainless steel can become contaminated, can become dirty, right? Uh, and therefore, it loses its efficiency. So it needs to be tested as well. Um, a little story on that will kind of take a little tangent here. Finish. We have, this is a sales pitch here, uh, at Cisco, a training system. It's a fully functional single sample point knock CO2 synthesis that we train our field service technicians on. And it's also available for clients if they want to come in and receive some training on it. Okay. Um, just as a point, that shelter is 22 years old. We built it back in 1999, shipped it to a site in Texas. Uh, they replaced it, I think, around. 2017, the new shelter we brought this back. So the shelter is old, but the system inside is pretty brand new. You can see we have a fully automated linearity audit solar rack on it. We even built our own little stack and drove up on it and whatnot. So uh, it's it's a like a functional system. But anyway, the only difference in there is that we have two sets of analyzers. We have a set of thermal analyzers and a set of tapping analyzers. So for training on thermal, we turn the valve from the sample to the thermal analyzers. And conversely, we're teaching on tapping analyzers and we work on tapping analyzers. But anyway, we have that thermal um, NOx analyzer there and uh, we put a converter efficiency tester in the rack we ran a converter efficiency test around that thermal analyzer and it was coming in at 88 percent and that's a fail so not knowing for sure whether it was our tester or the analyzer ray changed the converter out of the analyzer Bing, they were right up there 96 97 percent efficiency of the new converter so ray called thermal and said can we clean this Convert. And Thermal said, no. no. <laughs> well, that wasn't good enough for Ray. So Ray went ahead and cleaned it. How did you clean it? Uh, uh, first, they, the, the acid that we used to make to build the ammonia scrubbers, we filled that uh, converter with acid and left it for 24 hours, drained that, and then we hooked the uh, converter up to to power and basically put water in it when it was hot. So that makes a big steam, like steam tea kettle thing, and it, it purged a lot of the, the gunk out of the analyzer. And then we used compressed air to dry, to, to dry it out. And we you put it back in and the efficiency came back. Now, why that particular converter had that situation because that analyzer hasn't had a lot of hours of operation. So maybe some of the things that we've done testing wise caused it to become dirty. But we also blown up those analyzers on an emergency basis to customers who don't have a spare and have had an analyzer crash. So where it's been, what application it's been on, we don't really have a history on it. But suffice to say, Yes, the stainless steel capability can be rejuvenated and be cleaned, okay? But still has to be tested in order to know that it needs to be cleaned, all right? But I just want to kind of let people know that we do have the ability to, to train 
on that as well. And we can use that also in our various other media efforts and such. Okay, uh, back to why test efficiency. Uh, anyway, the manufacturing tip we give a man an However, there are some regulations that require periodic testing. Do we have anybody here from New Jersey? You do it on every three months, every every quarterly CGA, right? Okay. Um, there's a couple of accepted methods to do water efficiency tests. Uh, one is to use a cylinder bed or two gas. That's a relatively non stable gas. So you are always questioning whether it's really the efficiency or the cylinder gas that you're, you're questioning. The other is to use a 10 bar bag and fill it up with you know, gas and watch it to change over time. But both of them are time consuming. So this is why we come up with our little package, okay? The regulations of 40 CFR 60, right down the road here, and it's a definition 70, the NH people, I'm not sure are familiar with all of that. When you get right down to paragraph 824, the converter efficiency test, and then paragraph 8242, it's an alternative to use a procedure in paragraph 16.2 and 16.2.1 says use procedure in police CFR 86. 40 CFR 86 is mobile emissions. In my previous life with General Motors and I did a mission lab, those were the regulations we did on. And we ran this NOS converter efficiency test every 30 days on every analyzer and every test lab. So that's how we come up with it's okay as far as regulations go. It's acceptable. Okay? But it does require a piece of equipment. Okay? That's what we developed over there. Okay? Um, by the way, this is informal. You guys got a question. We'll wait till the end of how our balance to stop and get an answer. Anyway, we have two models that we have developed. We have the manual model, the model 2910, numbered it. It's portable, that's what's sitting on the bench right there. It can be used on multiple systems. Um, and the technician does a hand to the report. It's all the same, okay? So if you've got six or seven systems, you buy one of these and just put it on the system. System. Okay. We have a second model, which is the model model 2920, which is built right into the system. It's under PLC control. And once it's set up, you walk in, push a button on the OIT, the user's interface, and it runs through the test, generates a report. The senior does that for you, just like it does for the linearities in your CGAs. So, for the New Jersey people, that will cut down a lot of time and effort if that's installed, all right? Um, so anyway, that's the two models that we have. Um, Auto model 2920 is installed in that training shop. Yes, sir. Uh, the, on the first one, the versus technician report thing, and the seer also has the option they will manually type all that data into the seer. It'll be stored in there and uh, they'll get the nice pretty report out of that. Oh, one. that's great. I didn't know that. Thank you. That's our software group on top of it. <laughs> no, I didn't even know that. Okay. So we have that ability. We got to see our software at your site. Okay. Uh, and there's a picture of it. It's a very simple device. What was challenging was coming up with correct zone generator. There are other devices on the market that have very fancy ozonate generators in it and you're going to pay for it. Uh, way overkill for our application and our need. Uh, 
on that. So uh, you got to be, like I say, like something that's going to meet what we need, but doesn't overkill things. So the required connections on it is, of course, you need power to run your 20 volts uh, to run it. Uh, and you got three gas connections. You got two inputs. One is you know with nitrogen, one is through air, and then of course the output to the analyzer input. Now, what we anticipate you do is you use the span cylinder the range that you're going to be using on the analyzer you're going to be testing. Okay. That's one of the big problems with using a cylinder bit of two if you're going to follow the regulations. I think they want 40 ppm solar bit of two or something. Yeah. I mean, there was something like that, okay? Well, 40 ppm of NO2 on today's analyzers and converters, it just blows them up. They just can't handle them. It just doesn't really do with it, okay? So uh, <clears throat> we we use the NO cylinder that we use for span in the system. And you just route that through it, okay? So you're being fair to the analyzer. You're testing it on the range in which you're going to be generating your compliance data. Yeah. So there's just a little graph of uh, the uh, inputs and outputs of the CD test. Okay. Um, now, <coughs> you can bring your own cylinder along with you if you want to use that cylinder. I mean, you know, you have to use a cylinder that's on the shelter or jump system. Again. But uh, if you're going to be using this repetitively, it would be nice to kind of do some small modifications to your system so you can easily connect it, run the test, disconnect it, and take it to the next shelf. Okay? So for dry instrument here, we just tap off downstream the air dryer, um, use a T fitting and cap it. Okay? So that you can run it. You can tell how the proposal to pick it up. The NO spin gas the same way, except that that's a three way valve because you want to reroute the you know, span gas from the probe, if you will, system into the analyzer or into the uh, tester. And then the output is another three way valve. So that the, the analyzer can have a choice between getting its sample from the tester or from the system. Um, kind of, uh, you can see the uh, There's one on the clicker That's too. The, the three way valve that would reroute your NO span gas from the system up to the CE tester. There's just a T with an off valve here, and that can be downstream with the pressure regulator if you want to go upstream. And then, of course, there's this valve here that routes the uh, sample from the tester into the uh, NO tank. So the modifications to a system that you wanted to use on a continual basis is pretty simple. Okay. Um, inside that black box there from a plumbing <coughs> point of view is relatively simple. You bring in you know, you bring in air. Air is run through the ozonator lamp. The ozonator lamp is off. Air. If the ozonator lamp is on, out comes ozone. And it goes to a mixing tea. Um, the mixing tea then, um, your, your NO is created into NO2 because of the ozone, and it is on to the uh, analyzer. Okay. So there's some <clears throat> analyzer setup which will make your life a lot easier if you're uh, going to run this test here. Um, normally in a SIM system, the analyzer is set in an ox mode for the three of you know. However, your thermos, your cabbies have got the ability to go to the NOx in mode and it automatically switches back and forth between the two modes. 
How do you know they want the to that you produce? Good question. Um, you'll be able to see that <laughs> when we get to, to the chart. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, uh, this ozone layer that we're typically using right now um, on a nine part per million in a cylinder of gas, we can get about eight ppm available to us. We might be able on a higher concentration of cylinder of gas to get more out of it. But it's more than enough to test a, a 10 part per meter full scale range analyze. Okay? In fact, we have to be a little careful that we don't leave it on too long. It will just drive it all the way down to zero. We won't have any, and that's not per regulation, so you can't see that here. Uh, so anyway, you put the analyzer in the NOx and the NO mode. Uh, then we need to input and check the range and span values of both the NO channel and the NOx channel. Now, that's not something that we typically do in a SID system because you run NOx, you span NOx, you set up the NOx, uh, and you read the, the NOx off the cylinder and input that here. If you're going to use the uh, Converted efficiency tester, you need to set up both channels and span both channels, make sure that the ranges are in there and uh, the values are, are there. Okay. So once that's done, it's done. You don't have to do that every test unless you change the cylinder and you have to change the interval value as well as the NOx value that's in the computer. Uh, on the tap the analyzers, they have a converted efficiency coefficient in them. And be careful to make sure that's set to one so that your test is valid, meaning that it's not going to try to correct on you before you get a valid reading off of the test. I don't believe that's in the thermal analyzers. It's just the cap. Um, Germ span both the NO and NOx channels. That's not critical. You don't have to be absolute on it, just so that you're not failing the zero of the span on the analyzer. Because the test is a relative test. You start here, you go here, and you come back up here. And the efficiency is just how good you come back up. Okay. So uh, don't worry about being absolute and correct on that. A little funny story on that. Um, 40 CFR 86 has a requirement in it that the NO2 content in the cylinder be less than 5% of the NO. Okay, which back in the days when 40 CFR 86 was made, that was a big concern. I mean, you're talking thousand part per million cylinders of, of NO. Okay. Uh, in today's world, it's a ridiculous word. We don't worry about it. But anyway, to uh, verify that and include it in the report so that the report does meet the focus of our 86 requirements, we were calculating off the value of the analyzer. Well, the cylinder we have on our training system right there, there's 0.02 ppm you know, in the cylinder. We were coming up with negative efficiencies just due to the noise of the analyzer and the Cal error in the analyzers. Okay, so we had to back up our software and say, okay, we're going to calculate the efficiency off the values on the cylinder, not off the reading off the analyzer, because the analyzers are not that accurate and you can figure out what it would be. Yeah. Okay, so. Zero and span, yes, but it is not real critical. And a suggestion you can set your read times for five seconds. Most SIM systems are read times are set up on 10 seconds. You're not really interested in fast responses. But it'll slow you, it'll speed it up a little bit. Uh, in our training center there on the model 2920 auto, we can run the C test in. And that's got seven steps, whereas the manual doesn't have that. 
And then, don't forget to reach your head and not smoke with your tongue and tips. Those are just push buttons. I don't know how the analyzers. So, um, anyway, here's the chart. And um, there are, I can see, for the 2910, we've got uh, six steps. The first one is just to connect and activate it. Now, there is a power on off switch in the back, so be, be aware of that. Zero the analyzer. Then you span the analyzer on your Cal gas. All right. Now, keep in mind you're in the NO NOX mode, so you can see both the NO and the NOX value on the front of the analyzer. And you add a little bit of dilution air on step four. Now, these steps are a selector switch, as you can see right there. You can just rotate the switch through the steps. All right. So when you get to step four, you've now blended a little bit of air in with your NO gas. And you get about 90% of your step two. Step two. Oh, I guess it was step two. Yeah, ninety percent of step two. All right. And then in position five, we turn the oscillator on. We start generating ozone, which creates NO two, and you'll see your NO value drop down. Now your NOx value should stay about the same. And those are values that you record the ABCD values. And you drive your uh, NO value down to about 20% now. 15% um, is fine. You don't want to go below 10%. That's the limit in 20 CFR 86 regulations. Okay. And I have added a step six here, which is position five, which is not in the 20 CFR 86 regulations. But your ozone lamp can create some NONO2 from the nitrogen in the air. Okay. Now, typically that's less than 0.05 ppm. But when we're working in a 10 part familiar range, like we are working with in today's sense, uh, that 10 of a part per million can be very important in your calculations and efficiency. So if you want to be 40 CFR 86, 100% compliant, you can skip step six. Okay. But step six just adds a little bit of correction to the calculation. And then here's the calculations that you put in the values there. And you know, 100% efficiency. So again, we're pushing the NO down to So again, we're basically comparing this and this and the NO is up here, the NO is down here, and the NOx should stay right about there. Okay? Makes sense? Okay. You're good. Okay. You're good. Do you, do you still have slides? There's a worksheet that we've made up that you can fill out the comments on the worksheet. And then like I said, we put it into CDAR as it has suggested. Or we also have a form that you can put the numbers on that form and sign it and keep it as your record that you can run the test. And it has all the information as to the name and the plan the year. The analyzer, etc. etc. So there are some limitations on the 2910 as well as the 2920. We'll get to that when we get there. I have only tested it on the vacuum analyzers. You know what I mean by vacuum analyzers? We pass the sample by the analyzer, the analyzer has a little pump inside of it and it sucks the sample off the manifold. Pressure analyzer, you can drive the sample right into the analyzer. Okay. <coughs> Those are older type analyzers. I have not tested it on that. It might work. Okay. Um, in a California analytical uh, NOx analyzer, for instance, is a pressure one. Uh, 
Uh, I just haven't tried it. Um, and the inner to creation, which we were questioning here earlier. Um, this device is excellent for a 10 ppm flow. <coughs> like I say, it can pretty much eliminate your entire anode and make it an anode two. Uh, I believe it could be stretched to a 20 ppm full scale range as well. Um, in today's industry, if you can convert eight, nine, 10 ppm of NO2, you can convert the NO2 that's coming out of your process, right? Um, in the old days, we used to say, well, 5% is NO2 and 95% is NO, but in today's downstream of these SCRs, uh, we've seen as high as we can get. Okay. But still, 50 50, you get a 2 ppm limit on your plant, that's 1 ppm of NO2 and 1 ppm of NO, and you just tested it and said, I can convert 8 ppm with a 90 plus percent efficiency, you ought to be able to handle 1 ppm, right? Okay, so that's the lot there, all right? Um, like I say, if you get a bigger scale, a higher scale of analyze, you may not be able to drive it all the way down to 20%. I haven't tried it, I haven't tested it on that. So, again, I would think that we could run a 20 ppm real easy, a 50 ppm full scale range analyzer. Might be a little bit of Whether you get the regulators to agree to that. Uh, Here's the, the, the second model, the model 2920. A little simpler, even because the system supports it more than the former even does. Um, it's rack bound, five and a quarter inches in height. It's plumbed and wired directly into the system. It's behind the system. It's PLC controlled. Uh, set times are operator input. You need to set it up once or we set it up once. <coughs> Unless you do a big modification to the plumbing system, etc., that will kind of change. <coughs> um, so, if you have an OIT or the see the real new time interface, you got one input, push the button, and say start the test, just like you do for your audit test. Um, and then CR generates the report. Um, the additional system requirements when we build them system with this in order we were to go out and modify an existing system on it. Uh, we have to add two, three way solar valves. Great. Uh, we need five relay outputs from the PLC. And we need one analog input channel. And that's the end of the analyzer which we don't typically wire in. Um, and again, there uh, is our uh, plumbing diagram for for uh, our training system. There, there's that three-way soloing valve that we had. Uh, we route the endo span gas into the efficiency tester, and there's a three-way valve that routes it back out. And then we also supply air. So, those would be the plumbing modifications in a system to install the 2920. And again, internal plumbing is even simpler than the manual model because two solar valves are located outside of the system. And again, it's the same same function. You can bring air and NO in. Turn the ozone generator on, you put your mixing T and uh, generate your NO2 to uh, supply to your converter for its test. It has a little longer test procedure on it, um, seven steps in here. Um, we record or look at both the uh, NO and the NOx fan. And again, that was because we were going to calculate the you know, two percent component in the cylinder off the readings on the analyzer, which didn't turn out to be so successful. 
Okay. So they could actually skip, skip these first two steps here, really, uh, other than the fact that they can verify the fact that you know, the analyzer has been calibrated prior to your running the test. So that's not bad information to have. Okay. Uh, again, uh, we're in the Knox mode here and in the end mode mode there. Um, and that's controlled by the PLC. So again, you don't have to do an analyzer setup. Um, step three then, we look at the interval reading as it's been diluted because the dilution error is on. <clears throat> and we bring that C down to about 90% of step two, all right? And we turn the ozonator on and we bring that down here to between 10 and 20 percent, okay? I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. And then we go back to the NOx mode. And we're back up here and we read the NOx reading on the analyzer. And really, with all this fancy calculation over here, we're really looking for A to be as close to C as possible. A or C to 100 percent, I should say. So the calculation is the same on the um, auto model as it is on the, the manual model. Okay. Um, there's the CR report. Let's let a few little bugs that Brian and I are working out on it. But, um, we're getting there. Okay. CR will generate that, that report for you to get all the information on it that you need to verify that you run an efficiency test. Uh, there are some limitations on the 2920 as well. Uh, currently, we've only been able to test it and work on the thermal 22 now, analyzers only because the thermal allows us to do a remote remote control. You know, so I thought it previously went from the NO to the NOx mode. That was PLC control. Buttons on the analyzer once you start to test, you can walk off and have a cup of coffee. And I'll get you back in about two minutes. Okay. Uh, the T series happy analyzers don't have that function. We requested it and asked for it and begged for it and told them we needed it. And we get the nod. That's all the credit. Now, Cappy is coming out with the new end series analyzer. We haven't got any yet, have we? Oh, okay. They have told us in a uh, conference a year ago when they said, What is it that you need and want in an ox analyzer? Bob and I said, We need this. And they said, Okay. And supposedly, Bob, you had some conversation with them here recently that they said it's still under. Yep. Our, our contact says it's looking into it. Looking into it. <laughs> yes, the question. Yeah. So anyway, at this point in time, if you have capping analyzers, we really can't make the auto convert efficiency test work because we can't control the flow. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe someday you know do a little firmware update before us. They got the capability, they got the inputs. All they gotta do is do a little program programming to get it done. But so far they're not doing anything. So again, the end series maybe we'll have it. Um, and again the NO2 creation is the same for this. Can you be a range right? Um, These steps here are programmable in time. You have an input that you check for stability on the analyzer, type in. Uh, all seven steps in our training center take about 10 minutes to walk through. Okay? That is, except for step. 
four. Okay. Um, we have logic in the PLC that says look for this value. We will get down to about fifteen percent of this value here. Then you shut the step off. And the POC will automatically set the right time for you. If you go too long, you'll get down below 10%. If you don't go long enough, you won't get down to 20%. Okay? So, uh, although you can't override that, you can put a specific time in if you want, but if you set that input to zero as far as the uh, setting goes, then the PLC can take over control of the time of the step. So that you're going to get that 15% plus or minus for you. Uh, and again, this is a procedure clarification that applies to both models. For those of you who are reading the CFR 6, we've added that final step to the procedure. Get the Knox value on air with the Zeta lamp on. And you're going to come up with about 0.5. It's going to be about 0.1. Each lamp is a little different as the characteristics and whatnot. And it's just a fine tuned calculation to a little more accurate. Right? So we've added this variable in the CE calculation to compensate for the error 2 created by the Uzo lamp. Questions? I'm going to do a little time. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, like I say, we have updated. You mentioned New Jersey requires doing that quarterly. Isn't there one of the, doesn't CFR require it annually, 75 or 60? To, I mean, I think we do this, I think our test painters do it as part of RAD. But I don't most, know how they do it. Most test teams yeah. have got to do a pre and a post okay. efficiency test. Then they're allowed to correct their numbers by the efficiency number. Yeah, the test teams do. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know of any SIMS regulations. I know California that tried to push what, San Diego into doing it on a quarterly basis. They kind of resisted it. But it's written right in the 2005 manual in New Jersey, right? Yeah. So that would be there in New Jersey where we get most of the feedback <laughs> on the issues that they have with cylinders trying to, to, to come up with the 90% on, on a regular basis. And it's a challenge in using the cylinder method. Some of the, the people that do testing for them use the head bar bag method, which again, uh, they generally are able to get to the, the 90% ability. But that takes patience. <laughs> but the cylinders are totally unreliable. They really are. But when you have one, if you first buy it, you're, you're probably in pretty good shape. Six months later, you run the test and it's lost probably 5 10% of that mm -hmm. concentration. We have a, a cylinder bit of two and the three uses it on a comparative basis. It'll run it on a brand new analyzer to see what it comes up with, and then you can run it on the analyzer to be fixed and repaired and check to see how it compares. But that's the only feeling good that you have of that cylinder. It's not absolute. But if you're introducing an error using the cylinder over and over, can you that cylinder has to? Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just wondering why is the regulations not gone through the cumulative Why the regulations? Yeah, are there any other methods to be on Knox? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um your is pretty much in the NDIR or the um, yes, or the correlation you can read. And it'll use an external uh, NO2 to NO converter, which, which are made. Yeah, chemical luminescence is the US uh, 
basis, okay? Um, uh, when I started in this business, we didn't have chemical luminescence analyzers. That's uh, how much senior the title is, okay? Pushing 50 years now, okay? Um, the chemical luminescence NOx technology was developed by the four emission labs of the Uniform Education. And after they developed it, they had bought a high voltage transformer to generate an arc to create ozone to make the analyzer work from a little outfit in Massachusetts called the Thermal Electron Corp. And they decided that they were in the business of building automobiles, not analyzers, so they sold the patent rights to Thermal Electron. That's how they got into the analyzer business, building chemical luminescence analyzers. This was in the middle 70s. We got the class of chemical luminescence analyzers about 75. In the automotive industry for a And they have really been the US standard since then. But prior to that, we ran an NDIR vacuum analyzer for NO and an NDUV analyzer for the NO2. And then we summed the two readings together and came up with knots. Okay? But that took two analyzers to do that. And uh, UV analyzers are not that popular anymore. Primary because most UV uh, lamps don't last very long. It's going to be too hot. That's when you got a continuing repair problem with UV analyzers. But yeah, like I say Europe still uses IR. Still uses it already. Problem with that is that um, in a chemical luminescence analyzer, you may flow one liter per minute of sample into the analyzer, but what goes into the reaction chamber to be detected is what, 60 cc's, 50 cc's, something like that, if that much, okay? So that's all that's being run through this little you know, 2 to NO converter. When you put a NO2 to NO converter outside an analyzer, you run one liter per minute. To the analyzer, you're running one liter per minute to the NO2 to the NO converter, and therefore you're going to heat the catalyst up a lot faster. Or the same steam you're going to have to really keep it hot in order to have enough residence time in it to do the conversion. So, chemical luminescence is the is the route to go for NOx. So we'll put some of this information out on the website and uh, so you can take a look at it. But it's, I've got uh, some flyers up here. You're yeah. welcome to help yourself to a flyer. Um, Gene created that for us. You also, yeah. have we come up with any pricing for these options? Uh, yeah, I have, but and this is published everywhere, so we'll leave that quiet right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have to take in all this the accounts are developing, but it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. So, so will that be part of the certifying? Uh, we'll definitely plan on adding it into our systems as we move forward. It'll be an option just like our automated linearity right. is. And it's like, I don't see a plan. Would that be starting with the case? Right, you would start, you would do your efficiency testing with that and that would qualify for your certification. Yeah. That's the goal, that's the idea. Rather than having the Tumblr bags and the other bottles that uh, are a little questionable at best, uh, we have this option. So it's, that's one of the reasons that I got excited about it because we used it many years ago and then developed it, could build it, and tinker with things quite a bit. So. I think the effort could actually be before you Right, right. Yeah, I, the analyzer manufacturers are probably that way. They like to make money. <laughs>